The first thing I do as a clinician, if someone comes to me and says they're depressed, is ask myself a question. Are you depressed? Or do you have a terrible life? Now, maybe you're not depressed. You just have a terrible life. What does that look like? You have no relationship. Your family's a mess. You've got no friends. You've got no plan. You've got no job. You use your time outside of work, not only badly, but destructively. You have a drug or alcohol ha habit or some other vice, pornography addiction. Um, you are completely unengaged in the surrounding community. You have no scaffolding whatsoever. Like you just, you scale back the dragon till you find one that's conquerable that moves you forward. There's a, there's a rubric for life. Scale back the dragons till you find one conquerable and it'll give you a little bit of gold. You can't make yourself interested in something. Interest manifests itself and grips you. That's a whole different thing. And so what is it that's gripping you? And how do you conceptualize that? Is that a divine power? Well, it's divine as far as you're concerned because it grips you and you can't do anything about it. And so there's a calling in you towards what you're compelled by and what you're interested in. And sometimes that might be very dark and sometimes not. But you're compelled forward by your interest. And so it doesn't matter what you call it exactly. It doesn't matter to what it is, what it's called. It still is. And if you don't listen to it, that's the other thing. If you don't listen to it, and I've been a clinician and talked to enough people now, as old as I am, to know this absolutely. If you do not listen to that thing that beckons you forward, you will pay for it like you cannot possibly imagine. You'll have everything that's terrible about life in your life and nothing about it that's good. And worse, you'll know that it was your fault and that you squandered what you could have had. So, this is not only a calling forth, but a warning. You're somewhere and it's not good enough, right? That's the eternal human predicament. Wherever you are isn't good enough. And to some degree, that's actually a good thing because if it was good enough, well, <laughs> there's nothing for you to do. So it's actually maybe a good thing that it's insufficient. And that might be why sometimes having less is, is better than having more. And, and I don't want to be a Pollyanna about that. I mean, I know that there's, but it isn't always the case that starting with little is you, if you start with little, you start with more possibility. It's something like that. So you move from always from what's unbearable about the present to some better future, right? And if you don't have that, then you have nothing but threat and, and negative emotion. You have no positive emotion because the positive emotion is generated in the conception of the better future and then the evidence that you generate yourself that you're moving towards it. That's where the positive and fulfilling meaning of life comes. So you want to set up this structure properly. It's very, very important. And so what it means is that you want to be going somewhere that's good enough so that the going is worth the while. And you can ask yourself that. What is it that I would need to be striving to attain? And if you ask yourself that, that's to knock and, and the door will open. That's what that means. If you ask yourself that, then you will find an answer and you'll think, you'll shrink away from it. You'll think, well, there's no way I could do that. It's like, well, you don't know what you could do. You don't know what's possible. And you're not as much as you could be. And so God only knows what you could, what you could do and have and give if you sacrificed everything to it. You are not committed to something unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. Commitment and sacrifice are the same thing. You have to make sacrifices. And what do you have to sacrifice? You have to sacrifice that which is most valuable to you currently that's stopping you. And God only knows what that is. It's certainly the worst of you. It's certainly that. And God only knows to what degree you're in love with the worst of you. The infinite and the finite coexist. And most of the time, we're in the place of the finite. But that doesn't mean that the place of the infinite doesn't exist. It just means that we can't get access to it. We just get intimations of it from time to time. You know, when things are going perfectly well for you, on those rare occasions where everything comes together, for the brief moment you inhabit that divine place and you have some sense of what your life could be like if you organized it from the smallest element to the largest element. And that's a place that you can inhabit, if not forever, in a manner that at least felt like forever. And I think that, I think that the clinical evidence is clear about that. Because one of the things that we do know is that if you take people who are confronting terrible things and shrinking from them and you teach them how to 
structure their behavior so that they can advance with courage. Everything works better for them. Their fears decrease and their character grows. And so there might be enough of nature within us to help us withstand the nature that's outside of us. And it depends at least to some degree on how it is that we orient ourselves in the world to some, in, to, to some unknowable degree. And it works like this as far as I can tell, you know. When I talk to people about doing the future authoring program, they often put it off. And it's not surprising because it's hard. And, and be it, but it's more than that. They think, well, I don't know how to write. I'm going to do a bad job. I don't really like assignments. I'm going to have to do it perfectly. I need to wait till I have enough time. And like one of those is enough to stop you cold and all five of them, you're just done. And so I tell people, do it haphazardly, a tiny bit at a time and badly. Because you can do that. I tell my students when they're doing their thesis, master's thesis, write a really bad first draft. And then we have a little conversation about that because they don't think I mean that. Because it sounds like a cliche in some sense. It's not a cliche. It's not a cliche at all. It means you're a terrible writer. But, but if someone put a gun to your head and said, you have to have your 100-page thesis done by next Monday or I'll shoot you, but I don't care how terrible it is, you would sit down and write it. And the thing is, then you have it, right? Then, then you have something, and then you can fix it. You can iterate and fix it. That bad first draft, that's the most valuable thing. And so that's what you need. You need a bad first draft of yourself. And you might say, well, and there is a literature too that suggests that people are a lot more unhappy when they look back on their lives about the things they didn't do than they are about the mistakes they made while they were doing things. And so that's really worth thinking about too, because there's redemptive mistakes. And a redemptive mistake would be a mistake that you make when you go out and try to do something. You know, you actually, you think, okay, I'm going to try to do this. And you're not good at it. You make a bunch of mistakes. It's like, what, what's the consequence if you pay attention? Is You're not quite so stupid anymore. That's the thing, is you've been informed by, your, by the results of your errors. And so what happens is, you, you, you follow the beacon, you follow the light, and, and you're blind, so you don't know where the light is. It's, it's dimly apprehended only, and you're afraid to follow it. But you decide to take some stumbling steps towards it. And as you take stumbling steps towards it, you become illuminated and enlightened and informed. What happens then is the star moves. You move 10 feet towards it, and you think, no, that's not right. I didn't get it right. It isn't there. It's actually there. And so then you... You see it somewhere else and you shift yourself slightly and you move forward and that's what happens is that you continue as you change. The thing that guides you forward moves. It's not a permanent thing. You move towards it and it moves away. It guides you forward. And so you say, well, is what I'm aiming at paradise itself? And the answer to that is no, because what do you know? You, you couldn't see paradise if it was right in front of you, but you might get a glimmer of it. And so you move towards it and you grow. And then the next time you open your eyes, you see a little bit more clearly. And that's what happens is that just happens over and over, right? It keeps moving. I hit a wall, my God, and then I had to die a little bit and I barely got back up. It's a phoenix transformation at each, at each turn. And it's painful. But the thing is, is that even though you've, you've traveled 20 miles, let's say, on that road, and you've only moved three miles forward, you've moved three miles forward instead of falling backwards, because that's the thing too, is that if you stand still, you fall backwards. You cannot stand still, because the world moves away from you if you stand still. And there's no stasis, there's only backwards. And so if you're not moving forwards, then you're moving backwards. And that's more, more of the underlying truth of, of the Matthew principle. To those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. It's a warning. Do not stay in one place. And maybe you end up oriented at least reasonably properly. As you stumble forward, you, you illuminate and inform yourself. And perhaps that's partly because the world is made of information. And if you encounter it and tangle with it, then it informs you. And then you become informed. And then you're information. And then you're ready.